Hello, everybody, and welcome to Valdoco. My name is Father Mike Case, and I am on the animation team here at the Salesian Mother House, right at the original Oratory of St. Francis de Sales. And it's my pleasure today, on behalf of all of the Salesians here, to welcome you for this tour of the Basilica of Mary Help of Christians. A lot of history, a lot of spirituality, a lot of affection attached to this church that began for Don Bosco as the worship space for his boys, and then it became the center of the new Salesian congregation. Today, it is the pulsing spiritual center of the worldwide Salesian family. Before we go inside, I wanted to say a few words about the facade, because it says a lot about Don Bosco and his devotion to Mary Help of Christians, his vision of church, his love for the Lord Jesus, and his dedication entirely to young people. The facade, if you notice, is not a Baroque facade, which was very unusual in Don Bosco's time. In the 19th century, here in Turin, all churches were built in the Baroque style. Well, Don Bosco intentionally chose to step out of that architectural box, and he chose this Renaissance facade, inspired very closely from the major basilica of St. George in Venice. Why did Don Bosco make that choice? It was very intentional. He wanted to send the message. Devotion to Mary Help of Christians needs a universal embrace. It's not linked to Turin. It's not linked to Don Bosco because she is queen of heaven and earth and the, the effective help of Christians all over the world. So let's get a little bit closer to the church and I'll point out some of the interesting details for you. So the first statue to notice is the one of Jesus right above the entrance to the church. Let the children come unto me, for unto such as these is the kingdom of heaven. Really setting the scriptural tone for the whole Salesian mission. On either side of the front door, there are two other scriptural passages depicted where Jesus again is with young people. On the left, he is healing the deaf mute boy as if to say the Salesian mission is all about opening the ears and the hearts of the young to hear the voice of God. On the right, we have the frieze depiction of Jesus raising to new life, the son of the widow of name, as if to say that the Salesian mission consists in bringing joy to families as we accompany the young into the fullness of life that Jesus promises them. Slightly higher on the niches on the left and right of the pairs of columns. On the left we have Saint Joseph, who is the second patron of the congregation, the foster father of Jesus, and the man who taught the Son of God how to be a man. On the right side we have Saint Louis Gonzaga, the youngest canonized saint at the time, living example. The wisdom of Saint Francis de Sales was true. Holiness is for everyone, regardless of age. Up above, on the left and right of the clocks, there are two bishops. On the left, St. Francis de Sales, the patron of the Salesian congregation, whose spirit of loving kindness and human optimism breathed the Valdaco Oratory to life. And on the right, St. Maximus, the first bishop of Turin, the father of the church, calling to mind Don Bosco's strong sense of belonging to the church. Up above on the triangle, the tympanum, over the front, at the very top, three Roman soldiers who were martyred here as revealed to St. John Bosco by the Blessed Mother in a dream. Salutore, Aventore, and Octavio. Now, a curious thing, this is the Basilica of Mary, Help of Christians, but the statue of Mary on top of the cupola, the jewel in the crown, is not Mary, Help of Christians. It is Our Lady of Mercy, venerated in Savona, Italy. Why is that? Well, we get a clue on the artwork that appears between the pillars. On the left, we have Pope Pius V with an angel that says 1571, and high on the bell tower to the left, the Archangel Michael with a flag that says Lepanto. All those three go together, they give us a clue. On the right-hand side, we have Pope Pius VII with an event that happened in 1815, 
And on the right up above, we have the Archangel Gabriel with a diadem ready to crown the Virgin Mary. All of that speaks to why we have the devotion to Mary of Christians to begin with. Let's go inside and we'll try to fill in some of the details. Okay, everybody, mom's waiting. Let's go inside. What do you think? This basilica, as we see it today, developed over three different phases of construction. The first, obviously, overseen by St. John Bosco himself, began in 1863 and finished in 68. And then in the years following his death, it was his first successor, Blessed Michael Rua, who in the 1890s began adding some embellishments and expansions to the church. And then after Don Bosco was canonized in the 1930s, it was his fourth successor, Pietro Ricaldone, who to honor the canonization, pulled out all the stops and produced what we're looking at today. Now it's important to say, I think, that the, 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 the changes made were not so much to change Don Bosco's church, but rather to perfect and to complete the vision that he had and to honor that vision um, through the congregation's efforts after he passed. Now remember, this was already the third church that Don Bosco had built here in Valdocco. First, the very humble Pinardi Chapel, and then the Church of St. Francis de Sales, and then this one. It was elevated to a minor basilica in 1911, and the first recorded history we have of Don Bosco speaking about this basilica was in 1862. He had just finished a marathon of confessions for the boys in the Church of St. Francis de Sales and he came out and he opened his heart to one of his shy and studious boys, 17-year-old uh, Paul Albra, who would become his second successor. Well, as a priest, Paul Albera recounts this. He says, I remember that night in 1862, it was December, when Don Bosco said, Paul, I've been confessing the boys for hours. I have no clue what I heard and I have no clue what I said because the whole time I was confessing, I was distracted by this thought that just would not go away. Our Church of St. Francis de Sales has become too small for all of our boys. Even if we try to squeeze them all in, they don't fit. And so we're gonna have to build a bigger church, a better church, a more magnificent church, a beautiful church, and we're going to call it the Church of Mary Help of Christians. Right behind me is a beautiful statue of Mary Help of Christians, very beloved to the people of Turin, and she does three very important things. The first is on May 24th of every year. She comes out of the niche and she leads the procession through the streets of Turin for her feast day. The second thing she does is receive so many people every day who come before her imploring her intercession. And often they comment on the, the ample uh, mantle that she's wearing and its rich adornment as if to say there's room always for one more person under her mantle of motherly care from which are dispensed so many graces from heaven. Thirdly, her role is a historical one. She marks the spot we are on April 27th, 1865. The first cornerstone was laid for the construction of the church. In true Don Bosco fashion, he began to build this church without any money in the bank. But he was so completely convinced that our Blessed Mother wanted it and that she would make it happen. Almost a year to the day before the cornerstone was laid, the general contractor, Carlo Buzzetti, had finished all of the excavations for the foundations and he asked Don Bosco to come to symbolically lay the first brick for the next phase of work, which Don Bosco did. And then he turns to Carlo, who's surrounded by a bunch of people, and he says, Carlo, I want to thank you and pay you for all the work you've already done and forward you some money for the next piece. 
And so he pulls out his wallet and Carlo very hopefully puts his hands out, fully expecting to get a fistful of gold coins. And out of Don Bosco's wallet came a couple copper pennies. You can imagine that Carlo was a little bit uh, surprised and maybe even disappointed. Well, Don Bosco just smiled at him and at all the people and he said, you're gonna see, I am just the Blessed Mother's bookkeeper. She wants this church built and she's gonna find the funds to do it. You're gonna see. One of the most powerful stories of faith and action that allowed this church to be built is the story of Senator Cotta, a leading politician in Turin, a man of faith, but who was on his deathbed. And he asked that Don Bosco come and pray with him and anoint him in preparation for death. Well, Don Bosco went and they prayed, and after which Don Bosco looked at Senator Cotta and said, Senator, you're not going anywhere yet. The Blessed Mother needs you here. She needs your help to build the church that she's asked for. Well, Senator Cotta was taken not just by the apparent boldness of Don Bosco's words, but the utter confidence with which he spoke them. And so he mustered up whatever strength he could and said, I'll make you a deal, Don Bosco. If the Blessed Mother heals me, I will provide uh, a check for 2,000 lire every month for the next six months towards the construction of the church. Don Bosco said, I'm going back to the oratory right now. I'm going to storm heaven with prayers to our Blessed Mother, and you're going to see. Well, three days later, guess who walked to the oratory? Senator Cotta. He had had a recovery. And he came to Don Bosco with the first check for 2,000 lire, a promise he made good for the next five months. So after five years of construction, the big day had finally come. June 9th, 1868, the day they consecrated this beautiful church. Again, it's Father Paul Albera who provides a memory of that day. He says, I remember it like it was yesterday. Don Bosco beaming with joy, his eyes full of tears, climbing the steps up to the main altar to celebrate the holy sacrifice of the mass under the loving gaze of his mother, Mary Help of Christians. Now, that was one part of a very extended celebration full of song. And if you look up to my left, up above over the capitals of the columns, you see a word there in Latin, sancta. That is the beginning of an antiphon of praise and intercession to our Blessed Mother that goes the whole perimeter of the church. And so I'm going to just give you the English translation of what's written up there in Latin. Holy Mary, assist the destitute, strengthen the faint-hearted, revive the weary, pray for all people, intervene for clergy, intercede for women, rescue all sinners and all those who implore your holy assistance. Amen. Now that is an antiphon from the 11th century. For the occasion, Father John Caliero put it to music and it was sung by no less than 450 voices, divided in three choirs, distributed throughout the church, all singing at the same time, all directed by John Caliero by means of some kind of an electrical device. And so there were 150 voices here in the sanctuary space around the altar, tenors and basses representing the church on earth. Up in the catwalk around the cupola, 200 kids representing the angels and the church in heaven. And then at the back of the church at the entrance where the choir loft used to be, another 100 men, tenors and basses representing the church in purgatory. So here in the courtyard on the east side of the basilica, there's this plaque that was put up to commemorate the visit of uh, Pope Francis here on June 21st, 2015, on the occasion of Don Bosco's bicentenary of his birth. And on the occasion of that visit, he used that wonderful expression. He encouraged the Salesians to stay faithful to Don Bosco's three white loves. The first white love being the papacy, 
not a devotion to any one pope in particular, but to the popes as the vicar of Christ. The second two white loves of Don Bosco are the Blessed Mother and the Blessed Eucharist. These three white loves of Don Bosco come out loud and clear in the famous dream of the two pillars. The church is represented by the ship, the bark of Peter, and the helmsman is the Holy Father, the Pope. And the church then, the ship, is caught up in this violent battle at sea, enemies raging against the church's leadership, her teachings, her mission, and the Pope manages to keep his course steady and lead the church when he manages to anchor the ship to the Eucharist and to our Blessed Mother. Let's go now to the minor cupola where the Eucharist and our Blessed Mother are honored in a magnificent way. We're admiring now the interior of the minor cupola that illuminates the altar and the tabernacle and the beautiful painting of Mary Help of Christians, those two white loves of, of Don Bosco. If you notice on the base of the cupola, choirs of angels with clouds of incense adoring the Eucharistic Jesus. In the 16 windows that go around the cupola, 16 angels hold images of 16 titles of Mary taken from the litany of Loreto. But the heart of this decorative piece are those gold words that surround the image of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who inspired them. Ik domus mea, inde gloria mea. This is my home. From here, the glory of my name shall go forth. Those are words that were inscribed on Don Bosco's heart. Words he would tell his brothers later came from the Lord. Words that he heard in the dream of 1844, the field of dreams, where in that time when the oratory was wandering around looking for a permanent home, a time of anxiety and uncertainty for Don Bosco, the Blessed Mother appeared to assure him that the oratory would find a home in that church with the porticos. And Don Bosco says, I saw then a big tall church with music playing, calling me forth to sing the Mass. The Blessed Mother made a promise and she has kept it. This is her house and from here the glory of her name has gone out to all of you, wherever this video finds you, in your faith and in your trust in Mary Help of Christians. So we've said something about the minor cupola. There's lots more to be said, but we'll save that for when you come and visit. For now, let's talk about the major cupola. We're going to go right up into the major cupola, which is right up there. And we're going to fill in some of the blanks that I opened up outside of the church. Now, I have to walk on the roof to get up there, so I'll meet you there in just a little bit. So here we are in the cupola of the Basilica, a great place to understand where the title of Mary Help of Christians comes from historically. For us, it's primarily a spiritual invocation of Mary, and of course that's true. But it began to evolve over many centuries, starting from the awareness of Mary's help for her Christian people 
in various situations of threat and danger. The artwork that covers the cupola is called The Glories of Mary, and the three major historical episodes where Mary manifested herself as the help of Christians are depicted therein. And so, briefly a word about each of these historical moments. The first takes us back to 1571, to the Battle of Lepanto, a naval battle where uh, the Ottoman forces threatened really the invasion and the destruction of Christian Europe. Their forces predominantly outweighed the capacities of the Pope and the Christian West. And the Pope at the time was Pope Pius V. And so he amassed what he called the Holy League. He had all of the kings of uh, Europe, the, the Catholic kings, put their naval powers together to face the Ottoman threat. In addition, the Pope asked that all Catholics pray the rosary, invoking Mary's help in this battle that seemed literally an impossible battle. The long and short of it is, the Christian forces won and the threat was dispelled. That was the first episode in which Mary's intervention, her closeness to her people in time of need, began to resonate uh, in the church. In thanksgiving for her intervention in that battle, what did Pope Pius V do? Something that maybe we've said countless times but didn't realize it comes from this historical moment. In thanksgiving for Mary's help, Pope Pius V added an, an invocation to the litany of Loretto, namely, Mary, help of Christians, pray for us. The second historical intervention of Mary as help of Christians came just over a hundred years after the Battle of Lepanto. It was 1683, and the Ottoman threat was menacing the destruction of Vienna, and from Vienna, the rest of Europe. In this situation, it was the Polish king, John Sobielski, who invoked the help of Mary, and again, uh, the forces of the West, the Christian West, proved victorious. The third intervention of Mary as help of Christians takes us back to 1814. In 1808, Napoleon had invaded Rome and he took poor Pope Pius VII hostage for five years, first in Savona, Italy, near Genoa, but that didn't work too well for Napoleon because the Pope proved to be a rock star there. He attracted a lot of sympathies for the papacy and generated a lot of anti-French sentiments. And so Napoleon whisked him away to France, where he held him hostage at Fontainebleau Palace. Well, guess what, a, what day it was when the Pope was finally released? May 24th, 1814. The Pope obviously saw Mary's helping hand in his liberation. So he returned to Rome and in gratitude for Mary's help, he went first on a personal pilgrimage to Savona where he crowned the statue of Our Lady of Mercies, and then in September of 1815, he's depicted in the painting here. With one hand, he is pointing to the help of Christians, and in the other hand, he's holding the document, the papal bull, by which he took the memorial of Mary Help of Christians and elevated it to the rank of a feast for the church, a feast that we celebrate every year ever since on May 24th. One last episode where Mary intervened historically as help of Christians bears mentioning. It's not depicted here, but it has a lot to do with the growth of the devotion to Mary help of Christians in the time of Don Bosco. It happened in 1862, one year after the unification of Italy, and one year before Don Bosco began digging the foundations for this church. It was in the town of Spoleto, in the region around Perugia, this ancient, unnamed image of Mary in a dilapidated church spoke to a boy. And he told people about this, and people flocked there, and they received graces and favors. The Bishop of Spoleto was very sympathetic to this. And as the church had become a pilgrimage site, and the image of Mary was speaking to so many, he decreed that that nameless image be named Mary, Help of Christians. Now, Spoleto was also the, the see where Pope Pius IX had been bishop before being elevated to the papacy. 
So this was also seen as significant. The church and the state of Italy were in very tense times. Uh, secularization was undoing a lot of ancient papal and ecclesial prerogatives, and so the church was seen as being under attack. And so this intervention of Mary in Spoleto, where Pope Pius IX had been bishop, was seen as her coming to assist him, to encourage him in the task of leading the church. So with all of that history behind the devotion to Mary Help of Christians, what can we say about this painting of her that is right in front of us? This painting that is really iconic and that defines this as her church. This really is a masterpiece of paint on canvas, but more than that, it's a brilliant expose of Don Bosco's mind at heart at so many levels, his understanding of the church in heaven in relation to the church on earth. In 1865, he commissioned one of Turin's leading painter, Tommaso Lorenzone, to create this masterpiece, and he was describing to Lorenzone his vision he saw Mary at the center, surrounded by the apostles and martyrs and evangelists and confessors and virgins and all the choirs of angels. And Lorenzoni had to say, Don Bosco, it's a great vision, but it's too grand. We've got to bring it down a little bit. We can't possibly get all that into one canvas. And so this is the version that Don Bosco very happily accepted. Actually, he pretty much dictated how it needed to be. When they were working out the details, Lorenzoni asked Don Bosco, where am I ever gonna find a studio big enough to paint a canvas this large? It's seven meters by four meters, or 23 feet by 13 feet. And Don Bosco told Lorenzoni, well, that's a problem for the painter to solve. Lorenzoni was industrious and he solved the problem. He rented the biggest studio he could find in Palazzo Madama, which is in the heart of the old city, right across the courtyard from the royal palace. And he dedicated three years of his life to the creation of this painting. When it was done and it was installed here in the Basilica, Lorenzoni dropped to his knees and he cried. And he says, this is so beautiful. Certainly my hands could not have produced this alone. Heavenly hands must have been guiding my own. In the canvas, it's the Holy Trinity who holds pride of place. God the Father presides over the entire heavenly court. The Holy Spirit hovers in the form of a dove, while the all-seeing eye of God is the source of light for the entire scene. Baby Jesus is cradled affectionately in Mary's left arm as she presents him to the world for adoration. He wears a crown because he is the incarnate Son of God and King of the universe. His arms are open, they embrace the world, showering his mercy upon all who have recourse to him through his blessed mother. Indeed, if we venerate Mary at all, it's because of her relationship with Jesus. She appears as the help of Christians, reigning above a sea of light on a throne of clouds and majesty, while the choirs of angels pay homage all around her. Her royal cloak, draping majestically to her feet, symbolizes her boundless motherly protection. She is crowned not once, but twice. The 12 star diadem identifies her as Queen of Heaven, a symbol that is also found in depictions of the Immaculate Conception, a devotion so dear to Don Bosco and the growth of the oratory. It also alludes to the woman crowned with 12 stars in the Book of Revelations whose male child would triumph in the cosmic battle between good and evil. The royal crown proclaims that Mary is also queen of the world. The power symbolized by the scepter in her right hand evokes the words of the Magnificat, the Almighty has done great things for me. Gathered around her feet are the Twelve Apostles, the foundations of the Holy Catholic Apostolic Church on Earth. Each Apostle bears the instrument of his martyrdom. The rays of light emanating from the eye of God rest upon their heads as if to suggest that through their fidelity to Christ, they too share in the Angel Gabriel's promise to Mary 
The Spirit of the Lord shall descend upon you, and the power of the Most High shall rest upon you. Appearing beneath Mary's feet at the center of the painting are Saints Peter and Paul. Mary is portrayed then as the helper of the Vicar of Christ and the Church's entire mission. As Vicar of Christ, Peter holds the keys to the Kingdom of Heaven, while Paul, the intrepid missionary at Gentis, brandishes the sword of his martyrdom. Don Bosco wanted that his Salesians be distinguished by their filial devotion to the Pope as successor of Peter, and by their apostolic and missionary zeal, all under Mary's guidance and care. On either side of Saints Peter and Paul are the four evangelists with their respective symbols. John and Mark on the left, Matthew and Luke on the right. They are portrayed larger than life to emphasize the importance of the Gospels in the life of every Christian and the life of the Church. Between Saints Peter and Paul, we get a glimpse of Earth from Heaven. Daily life at the Oratory in Turin is represented in the foreground, and further back, amidst a golden sunset up on the hill, the Basilica of Superga, dedicated to the birth of Mary, and built in thanksgiving to Mary for her help in sparing Piedmont from invasion. Don Bosco's message was clear, and he would say about this painting, paraphrasing, 20 centuries of experience have shown us that the Blessed Virgin Mary from heaven continues the mission that she began on earth as mother of the church and help of Christians. A few words about the altar space. Certainly the image of Mary dominates the sanctuary. And it's interesting to note that from left and right of the sanctuary, Mary's parents are looking on with pride. To my right is a statue of St. Anne, and to my left, a statue of St. Joachim. And it's kind of heartwarming to imagine Mary's parents gazing upon her in pride as she fulfills her vocation as the help of Christians and leading all people to Jesus. Because that indeed is the purpose of that big painting of Mary, as well as all of the beautiful marble embellishments around it. It's like a crown that draws attention to the presence of Jesus here in the celebration of the Eucharist and in the reserved Eucharist in the tabernacle. Now, I'm standing here deliberately because I want to indicate this to you. This brass cross on the floor indicates where the original high altar used to be and where the big painting of Mary, Help of Christians used to be. Before the renovations done after Don Bosco's canonization, the altar was here. The church ended here. All of the space behind me was enlarged in the renovation to create this majestic worship space that we enjoy. Let's take a look at some of the details involved in this beautiful high altar. On either side of the painting and the tabernacle, notice the saints in white marble. These are all saints that were renowned for their devotion to Mary. On the left side, going from bottom to top, St. John Damascene, St. Dominic Guzman, St. Ephraim, and St. Bonaventure, St. Rose of Lima, and St. Catherine of Siena. And on the right side, St. Cyril of Alexandria and St. Stephen of Hungary, St. John Bosco, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, St. Mary Mazzarello, and St. Bernadette Subiru. At the center of the high altar, of course, is the tabernacle. 
And remember that when Don Bosco celebrated Mass in his day ad orientum, this would have been the focus for the priest, the presider, and for the people attending Mass. This is a gilded brass uh, plated door against a marble background, and there's depictions of grapes and wheat of evoking the Eucharist. The image of Christ is there at the center, and at his feet two deer, evoking Psalm 42. Like the deer that yearns for running water, so my soul yearns for you, my God. And one of the deer is looking up at Jesus crucified, and the other one is already lapping up life-giving waters and that exudes from Christ on the cross. Now, beneath the crucifix is another classical a Christian symbol for Christ, the mother pelican who pierces her own breast so that she can feed her own blood to her children to sustain them and help them grow. All around the tabernacle, notice the angels looking on. It's an effort to evoke the heavenly court. I haven't done the count myself, but apparently there are 483 angels depicted in this basilica. Please come and count for yourself and let me know if my numbers are accurate. Up above the tabernacle, to left and right, are two large angels holding these sanctuary lights to indicate the real presence of Jesus. They're big on purpose to make a point. This is a big deal. The real presence of the Lord is among us. On top of the tabernacle, on the flat surface, that's where they used to put the monstrance for Eucharistic adoration. Right over here, they would put the monstrance here, a big monstrance, with two angels on either side, holding a crown over the monstrance in which Jesus was exposed. Pretty impressive way to pray. Final detail about the sanctuary it has a beautiful mosaic floor, and at the very center of it, right beneath the altar, is a beautiful coat of arms of the Salesian congregation. All of this floor was uh, refurbished in 2009 in preparation for Don Bosco's bicentenary in 2015. Literally wrapped around the painting of Mary Help of Christians on the high altar, the basilica is like a tightly woven tapestry of Salesian family history and spirituality. Basilica was the first of three monuments that Don Bosco built in honor of Mary Help of Christians. The second came the year after the consecration of the Basilica in 1869. Don Bosco founded the Association of Devotees of Mary Help of Christians, known as ADMA. But then he wanted a third monument, a living monument. And so it was that in 1872, with Maria Domenica Mozzarello, he founded the Institute of the Daughters of Mary Help of Christians, the Salesian Sisters. And of course, it was Mary Domenica who was the living cornerstone of that monument to our Blessed Mother. A fun fact, or maybe it was divine providence, in 1864, when Don Bosco made the first brick for the building of this church, he also met in Mornese, Mary Domenica Mazzarello. This chapel is adorned with three beautiful paintings by Crida. The one in the center, right above the tomb of Mary Domenica, depicts her in all of the glories of heaven. On the left, it's a painting of her being elected as superior to the sisters on June 15, 1874. And on the right, a painting of her audience with Pope Pius IX, which was granted to Mother Mozzarello and the first Salesian Sister Missionaries on November 9, 1877. Originally, this chapel was dedicated to St. Anne, the mother of Mary. Uh, the painting that adorned the space is now in Museo Casa del Bosco. It was in the 1890s that that Father Michael Rula, Don Bosco's first successor, rededicated the chapel to the three Holy Roman Martyrs. During the renovations that were made in the 1930s, the chapel of the Holy Martyrs was relocated to the passage that had been built behind the sanctuary in order to allow Mother Mozzarella 
to be honored here. There are a number of really beautiful statues in this church. Two bear mentioning at this point as they flank the altar and the chapel of Mary Mozzarello. The one on my right is St. Agnes, and she's there because she is one of the patrons of the Salesian Sisters. And the one on the left is St. Cecilia, patron of musicians and singers. And why is she there? Because historically, when Don Bosco had the church consecrated, over the front entrance was the original choir loft. And so the statue of St. Cecilia indicated the place where the staircase was that took the musicians and singers up to their place. So right across the nave from the altar of Mary Mozzarello is the altar of Saint Dominic Savio. It was dedicated to him in 1914, but before that, it was first dedicated to the Sacred Heart, a devotion very dear to Don Bosco and the Salesians, and it has now been moved to the chapel just to the right of Dominic Savio. After that, it was, it was Michael Rua who rededicated the chapel to St. Francis de Sales. Yes, there was already the Church of St. Francis de Sales, but after Don Bosco's death, people were being loyal to Don Bosco, but kind of forgetting about the spirituality of our patron. And so very wisely, Michael Rua wanted to kindle the fires, as it were, of our devotion and appreciation of our patron. And so there are two very particular and beautiful paintings here in this chapel. And then there's a third one that is no longer here, and it's now at the Museo Casa Don Bosco. The one in this chapel to my right depicts St. Francis carefully scrutinizing the proofs of a publication before it goes to press. He was very active in what we call today social communications, so much so that he is the patron in the church for publishers and social communicators. On the other side is a painting of Francis de Sales engaged in discussions, theological exchanges with the Calvinists. And because of his profound knowledge of scripture, because of his gentle and wise ways, he was able to bring a lot of people back to the Catholic faith, so much so that he also bears the honor and the title of being a patron saint of ecumenists. This is the third uh, painting of St. Francis de Sales that used to be in the side altar. Here he's depicted very much as the man of prayer. His gaze is fixed contemplatively on heaven. There's the heavenly host all around him. He's on his knees and he's writing his spiritual treatises or his spiritual direction letters by which he guided so many souls. And at the base of the Prie-Dieu is a copy of the Philothea, the introduction to the devout life a book that even today remains very, very popular for those seeking a deeper relationship with God. In 1914, this marble crypt was where the human remains of Dominic Savio were honored. When he was canonized in 1954, he was moved into the gilded uh, casket that is at the heart now of the altar where he was honored. Above him is a very moving picture a very historical and very meaningful. You have Mama Margaret signaling to Don Bosco as they're both observing the prayerfulness and the sincerity of Dominic Savio before the Blessed Mother. And Margaret says to her son, listen John, you have a lot of fine boys at this oratory, but keep your eyes on this one. Dominic has something very special. Very special indeed. And his goodness made him a leader, not just among his peers at the oratory, but also as a leader from up in heaven. All of these gifts here, these blue and pink bowls and cushions and such, are all ex voto expressions of gratitude for prayers answered and life and graces received through the intercession of this youthful saint, the youngest saint in the church, before the seers of Fatima claimed that title. This is the crypt of the Basilica, the Chapel of Relics. We are really blessed in this Basilica to have buried here not only three saints, uh, St. Dominic Savio, St. Mary Mozzarello, and St. John Bosco, whose tomb we'll see in just a little bit, 
But we also have two blesseds buried here. We also have the relics of our Salesian proto-martyrs, as well as hundreds of relics from other saints associated with the Salesian family. As successor of Don Bosco, the Rector Major of the Salesian Congregation has the honor of being buried here. They are all buried in this crypt. Two of them are already blessed. To my left is the tomb of Blessed Michael Rua, first successor of Don Bosco. And to my right, the tomb of his third successor, Blessed Philip Rinaldi, the founder of the Volunteers of Don Bosco. A dream come true for Don Bosco was the expansion of his mission to China, but that was also where our proto-martyrs uh, gave their life for the faith. Here are the relics of Bishop Luigi Basilia and Father Calistus Caravaggio, who were martyred in China on February 13th, 1930. Now we're looking at the altar of St. Joseph, a very special altar for many reasons. It was commissioned by St. John Bosco himself, by the same painter who did the image of Mary Help of Christians, Thomas Lorenzone, and it was completed and blessed by Don Bosco on the Feast of St. Joseph, six years after the church was consecrated. The feeling, if you want, between this holy family is very tender and beautiful. You have Joseph holding baby Jesus and they're kind of leaning into each other very comfortably as Mary looks on, her hands clasped prayerfully in admiration of this tender bond between father and son. Baby Jesus is holding a basket of white and red roses. So many graces and blessings that he bestows upon us, even through the intercession of St. Joseph. Notice how it's St. Joseph who takes those graces and blessings, those roses from Jesus, and drops them, as it were, from heaven onto the church below. At the foot of the painting is the basilica itself and the oratory as it was at the time when this painting was made. Don Bosco once commented that the roses could also be seen as the struggles and joys in life, and perhaps the ones that help us grow more in our faith are the struggles. Above the Holy Family, there are two cherubs who hold a banner with the words, Ite ad Yosef, a quote from Genesis chapter 41, that in Christian tradition has been applied to St. Joseph. Go to Joseph in your time of need. There's another angel that's holding a lily in full bloom. The lily obviously represents the, the chastity of St. Joseph, for which he is so revered. But there's also a tender historical connection in the face of that little angel. A couple years before this painting was done, the daughter of a Marchiones Passati died very, very young, and the mother was heartbroken. So St. John Bosco had the tenderness of telling Lorenzoni to depict the child's face as the face of this angel, and obviously we can imagine how moved and grateful a grieving mother was. Above the frame, just beneath the triangle, there's another Bible reference, Psalm 140, he made him the master of his house. That again has been interpreted as referring to St. Joseph, whom God chose to be the father of Jesus and the husband of Mary. It's also been applied to St. John Bosco, who chose and took Joseph as the secondary patron for the Salesian congregation. Now there's one more reason why this altar is so special. Of all the altars in this church, this is the only one that has remained exactly as Don Bosco wanted it, designed it, and saw it. Two years after the Basilica was consecrated and four years before the painting of St. Joseph was done, he was declared patron saint of the Universal Church in 1870. And we see in the windows on the left and right of the altar 
depictions of St. Joseph that have nourished the Church's faith life throughout the centuries. On my right, St. Joseph as the patron of a happy death, he who we imagine had the comfort and the joy of having Mary and Jesus with him at that time of passage from this world to the next. And on the other side, Joseph, the protector, Joseph, who in a dream heard the call to flee with his family to Egypt to protect the child Jesus, a message that is so actual today at a time when so many people around the world are migrants and seeking a place to call home that is safe and welcoming. Further up on either side of the altar, two biblical characters, King David on the left, he from whose lineage would come Jesus Christ, the eternal King, and on the other side, the prophet Isaiah, who foretold that the virgin would bear a son and call him Emmanuel. A scriptural basis then for the Holy Family that was entrusted to St. Joseph's care. On the bell towers of the Basilica, there's this great big clock, and it rings on the hour, the quarter hour, and the half hour, and it makes the bells ring Ave Maria. Well, in the last months of 1887, the clock broke and the bells fell silent. Those were the months of Don Bosco's final illness. Without anybody having done any repairs, the bells rang again for the first time early in 1888, specifically at 4.30 in the morning on January 31st, the moment that Don Bosco was born into heaven. This altar today is dedicated to St. John Bosco. It's quite powerful to think that Don Bosco rests here, awaiting the glory of the resurrection of his body at the very altar where in his lifetime he offered the holy sacrifice of the Mass every day. In his time, this altar was dedicated to St. Peter, and Don Bosco had a very fond affection for St. Peter and for the successor of Peter, Pope, as Vicar of Christ. This altar, as we see it today, was completed in 1938, and inside the bronze and crystal urn are the human remains of St. John Bosco, preserved and venerated within the statue that represents him uh, dressed in priestly vestments, which were a gift from Pope Benedict XV. His face and his hands are coated in wax and painted to give a more lifelike impression. A beautiful feature of this altar is the way it was designed to allow devotees to get a close-up look at Don Bosco from the other side. I can tell you that visiting Don Bosco like that never gets tired for me. On the sides of his altar and up above, are the three theological virtues. On this side is the angel carrying the Eucharistic host and the chalice, the virtue of faith. On this side, the angel holding the flaming heart, the virtue of charity. And the beautiful painting that is on top of the altar, for me, is a wonderful depiction of the virtue of hope. We're destined for heaven. And just as St. John Bosco brought so many young people to know the Lord and the fullness of life through Mary's intercession, so too can we believe and hope that heaven is ours as we come to Mary for her assistance and she will guide us in time and prepare us for eternity. One of the many good examples that Don Bosco gave us was recognizing a good thing and running with it his altar is flanked by two of his big inspirations as educators. On the right, St. Philip Neri, the joyful saint, the founder of the Oratorians. And on the other side, St. Jean-Baptiste de La Salle, the founder of the Christian Brother Schools. Further up above the altar of Don Bosco are two windows that 
shine the light on the presence and guidance of Mary Hoffman Christians from the earliest days of Don Bosco's life and the oratory. Mama Margaret, who came to the oratory and spent 10 years here, her whole life having taught Don Bosco to love Mary and to spread devotion to her once he became a priest. And of course, the providential encounter between Don Bosco and Bartholomew Gorelli on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception in 1841, marking the birth of the oratory. What you're seeing now is the magnificent pulpit from which Don Bosco preached so many times, especially on, on holy feast days. It's a pulpit made of walnut, and it was designed by Spezia, the very architect who designed the original basilica. Underneath the canopy inside the pulpit, there's always traditionally, as here, a symbol of the Holy Spirit calling down divine inspiration upon the preacher that he might fulfill the task entrusted to him by the Lord and engrave on the marble plate above it, preach the gospel to all of the earth. So a fun fact, after all the renovations to the Basilica over the years, only three pieces here remain unchanged as they were in Don Bosco's days. And you know what they are? The altar of St. Joseph, the painting of Mary Help of Christians, and this pulpit. And so as we come to the end of this guided tour, I thought it might be meaningful to listen to one of the most powerful homilies that Don Bosco preached from the pulpit on November 11, 1875, when he was commissioning his Salesians off to South America on the first missionary expedition under the guidance of John Caliero. As we listen to the words, let's see how they might apply to each of our own lives, each of our own mission, under the watchful gaze and protection of Mary, help of Christians. Even if my soul is unsettled at this moment, as you prepare to leave, my heart is deeply consoled to see our congregation ready to take this next step. Although we are so few, we are able to contribute our own small stone to the great building that is the church. Yes, go forth filled with courage and remember that there is only one church throughout Europe and America and the whole world. One church which holds in her bosom the inhabitants of every nation who wish to seek refuge in her motherly embrace. Wherever your new home might be, my beloved sons, you must always remember that you are Catholic priests and that you are Salesians. Therefore, the same gospel preached by our Savior, by his apostles, by the successors of St. Peter, down to our times, the same religion, the same sacraments, you must love jealously, profess sincerely, and preach exclusively to all you shall meet. Go then, you will certainly have to face many struggles, trials, and dangers, but do not be afraid. God is with you. He will give you grace so that you can say with St. Paul, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We all share somehow in that mission by our connection to the Salesian family. At the entrance of the church, across from the painting of the two pillars, is this painting which depicts the mission of the Salesians. You have Don Bosco in a boat accompanying the young people through stormy waters, through his accompaniment and his system of education, helping them to navigate the stormy seas of life where they may be prevented from all harm of body, mind, and spirit and through Mary's intercession come to the heavenly kingdom, which is depicted by the castle in the top corner, and the rainbow, a biblical symbol of the covenant. That is precisely what Mary looks at from her vantage point above the altar. And it's as if she's telling us, my dear sons and daughters, keep your eyes focused on that mission, 
all of this marble and all this magnificence is for naught unless you allow it to inspire you to keep carrying forth that mission for which I inspired that dream of nine years, for which I raised up the congregation, and for which, yes, I even asked that this church be built, that the young might be inspired to trust me to bring them to the Lord. So this brings us to the end of our visit. Thank you for having come along. And remember, this is our church. This is our mother's house, and we are always welcome here. Even the Turin newspapers, when the church was consecrated, noted that this is a church that was built for the poor and by the poor. And Don Bosco loved to remind people that every brick used in its construction represents a grace received through the intercession of Mary, help of Christians. Well, she has many more graces and blessings to share with us. And so let's remember those words of Don Bosco, put your trust in Mary and you will see what miracles are. Until we have the pleasure of meeting together here in Valdoco, may our Blessed Mother watch over you and your loved ones, guide you and help you. Mary, help of Christians, pray for us.